Thank, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Thanks to all of you for turning out today. Uh, this uh, has been a great conference, I think, and a very important uh, restart here on a, on a subject that uh, is obviously of critical importance to the United States, uh, especially in a presidential election year. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the threat that radical Islam and political Islam more broadly uh, pose to the United States and its friends uh, in Europe uh, and elsewhere around the world. I think it's important that, uh, that we try and say at the outset, every time this subject comes up, uh, that uh, we are talking about politics and ideology here. This is not a question of religion. And those who say that when you talk about radical Islam, you're insulting Muslims all over the world, uh, are simply engaged in propaganda. It's actually <laughs> Muslims themselves who have felt the uh, worst effects of Islamic terrorism and who suffer under uh, its rule in places uh, as diverse as Iran and, and the caliphate that ISIS uh, now holds. King Abdullah of Jordan, who is not simply the Muslim king of a Muslim country, uh, unlike our president, King, King, Abdullah, King Abdullah and other uh, uh, political leaders in the Middle East have said this is a civil war within Islam. It's a struggle for uh, how the religion is perceived around the world. You think of uh, General el-Sisi in Egypt who was courageous enough a couple of years ago uh, to join the Coptic Christians and the Coptic Coptic Pope in their celebration of Christmas and to say that we are all Egyptians together, thus, among other reasons, putting a target on his back from the Muslim Brotherhood. So, so I think this is a, a critical distinction to make uh, and one that, uh, that, that those who don't want to have a, a clear understanding of radical Islam are quick to try and obscure. But what's also important to understand is that we face this uh, threat uh, from many different perspectives. It is not simply ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It's not simply extremists from uh, the Sunni uh, world of Islam. Uh, it comes in a variety of different forms. Uh, let's never forget that the Ayatollahs have since 1979 been the world's central banker for international terrorism. They are uh, even under Obama, still on our list of state sponsors of terrorism, uh, and quite rightly, they're equal opportunity terrorist supporters, Hezbollah and Hamas, just as two examples. Uh, and we're now seeing in Turkey another uh, phenomenon of, uh, of a form of radical Islam that, uh, that we're still slow to understand in this country. So that's point number one. This comes in a variety of different forms. That doesn't make it easier to deal with, it makes it harder to deal with. I compare it in some respects, and the analogy is uh, far from perfect, but I compare it to the kind of anarchy that we saw in uh, Europe after World War I, when established empires had broken apart and anarchism and fascism and communism uh, sprang up in all different kinds of places, not successfully, except in the case of Russia. But uh, the fact that there was so much turmoil didn't make it easier to try to uh, restore order. Ultimately, it led to fascism in Italy and Nazi rule in Germany. Uh, so they, they come in different forms, but their totalitarian urges are the same. And that's true for radical Islam today, all across uh, the broader uh, Middle East. And second, it's important for us to understand that the strategic threats that the United States faces are not simply from the radical Islamists themselves. Other powers uh, that don't wish the United States or our friends well are fishing in these troubled waters and are making alliances of convenience with the radicals, sometimes providing them material support, sometimes just being on the same side, sometimes turning a blind eye to what happens that cause us trouble as well. So let's take a look at a couple of uh, uh, of these threats uh, and, and see what, uh, what we need to do about them. And let me just start with Turkey, uh, because I think this is a profound uh, moment of crisis in Turkey. Uh, 
It's been building for a long time, but it has uh, uh, both of the elements that I mentioned. We don't think of Turkey as a problem from an Islamist's point of view, uh, but it is now. Uh, and it's a prime example of an external power, in this case Russia, taking full advantage of an Islamist uh, uh, wannabe to cause us and our friends in the Middle East trouble. Now, it's very clear that after World War I, when the Ottoman Empire was broken up and the last Islamic caliphate uh, uh, ended, that Mustafa Kemal and his cohorts in the Turkish military wanted Turkey to be a secular state, would be Islamic in the religion of the people, but it would have a secular constitution. It would be oriented toward Europe. They redid the Turkish alphabet, just as one example of an effort to do that. They established the judiciary and the military as guarantors of the secular nature of the Turkish constitution, something perhaps hard for us to understand in the West to see the military in that role. But they knew that the Ottoman Empire and what was left of it in Turkey carried this baggage of uh, political Islam uh, all across the country and that it would take time to overcome it. Sadly, they didn't move fast enough. And now we have uh, President Erdogan who is exploiting uh, the opportunity that's been provided by uh, recent events uh, to move the country in a direction that he's been very clear throughout his political career that he wants. He wants an Islamic state. He wants the end of the Kemalist uh, secular vision for Turkey. Uh, he's worked over the past uh, 10 or 12 years to purge the military of secular leaders. He's done the same in the judiciary. Uh, he is an authoritarian by nature. He said 20 years ago when he was mayor of Istanbul, democracy is like a streetcar. You ride it to the stop you want, and then you get off. And he's getting off right now. The failed military coup, in my view, was most, was most likely the last gasp of the secular generals. I think they figured that uh, if they waited even six months or 12 months or longer, they'd have no chance. Uh, they may have thought their chances were slim, but they decided to move. They turned out to be either wrong or ineffective, and uh, obviously we see uh, what's happened in the aftermath. Uh, there are press reports from Turkey that the government is going to release 38,000 ordinary criminals uh, from Turkish prison so they can fit the people that uh, Erdogan has arrested. The last number I saw was a mere 16,000 uh, political opponents that he's arrested. He said these were coup plotters. You know, look, if they had been coup plotters, uh, the coup would have succeeded. <laughs> Um, and obviously, if you do the math, there are about 22,000 more people who ought to worry they're about to get arrested, too. So what he's doing is clearing the boards of his political opposition. Uh, whether he will go so far as to declare a Turkish caliphate or not, I don't know. Uh, but he has certainly uh, done everything uh, necessary to lay the groundwork for it. And here's where the second aspect comes in. He's now openly negotiating with Moscow uh, for a new Turkish-Russian relationship. Now, this over the centuries has been a very uh, fraught relationship uh, for geographic and political reasons that, uh, that we don't have time to go into. But look, the first uh, post-coup meeting with a foreign leader that Erdogan has would, had was with Putin in Moscow. Uh, his, uh, one of his deputy prime ministers said yesterday that uh, they would consider allowing Russian uh, uh, fighter planes and bombers to use the Inserlik air base, which is where American uh, forces have been based for decades. Uh, they attacked other NATO members for not being transparent with them. Turkey's obviously in a huge confrontation now with the European Union over both Turkish uh, emigres into Europe and also the, uh, what must be now in the millions, so-called Syrian refugees that they've allowed or encouraged to transit Turkish territory to enter into the continent of Europe. Um, uh, th this is, this is a, a potentially profound moment for Turkey's relationship with the West. It may be uh, that it uh, doesn't uh, want to sustain membership in NATO. Um, it, it, is, uh, it, it will mean a, a huge strategic loss for the United States 
Uh, if we remember Turkey's role during the Cold War, it's absolutely pivotal. Uh, it controls, obviously, the Dardanelles and the Bosporus, the access from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean uh, that's been the subject of Russian-Turkish uh, hostility over the centuries. Uh, and it was historically seen as NATO's link uh, to, the, to the Muslim world in the Middle East. All of this is at risk now. Now, I'm not saying it's completely gone, but it's hard to see who in Turkey will raise the alarm for the Turkish people. I don't really think that's where they want to go, but that's where Erdogan is taking them. And since most of his political opposition has either fled the country uh, or is in prison or soon will be, uh, it, it's hard to see where uh, there's any way of stopping uh, this progress. In response, the Obama administration has sent Joe Biden to Ankara. So you can see why I'm so pessimistic about, uh, about the chances here. Th this, is, uh, th this is one of the pillars of potential conflict in the region. You have the Persians in Iran, the Turks in Turkey, uh, and obviously the Arabs led more or less informally by uh, Saudi Arabia just for financial reasons if no other. These three great contending uh, forces that uh, have been in conflict uh, for millennia now, you can see this rising again. And it's no secret that uh, particularly in response to Iran's nuclear weapons program, uh, Turkey itself has begun a nuclear program that undoubtedly has uh, a weapons orientation in mind. So here we have uh, a country that's been an ally of the West for decades, moving away from us while the United States watches it happen. Uh, turning to the larger Middle East itself, uh, this is a period of chaos. We've moved from a point where we have a crisis in this country or a crisis in that country or a crisis in another country to the entire region spinning into anarchy. Uh, this is potentially uh, catastrophic for Israel, catastrophic for the oil-producing monarchies on the Arabian Peninsula. But look at what's happening. Uh, borders and governments that have existed for a century or more, some obviously less than that, are disintegrating. Uh, effective state control over large swaths of territory has uh, ended. Uh, just start from uh, Western Africa, you, you've seen the uh, Islamic terrorists attack uh, oil and gas facilities in Algeria. They nearly took control of the government of Mali. Uh, Libya has completely disintegrated, and even the uh, recent uh, uh, success, if you can call it that, at the city of Sirte against the Islamic State doesn't fundamentally change the balance of forces there because the uh, ISIS fighters uh, uh, largely escaped in fairly good order from what I've been able to see. Boko Haram is ripping uh, Africa apart in the seam between uh, uh, largely Arab, largely Islamic North Africa and uh, uh, Sub-Saharan sub Africa, black, largely Christian and animist uh, in Nigeria, in Cameroon and, uh, and in other countries as well. Uh, Sudan is uh, descending into multiple civil wars yet again, Sudan and South Sudan. Somalia hasn't had an effective government in over 25 years. Egypt has lost control of the Sinai Peninsula and weapons traffickers, human and drug traffickers uh, are rife in, uh, in the Sinai. In uh, Yemen you have the uh, rare distinction of uh, a, what used to be a country hosting uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, ISIS. Uh, the Houthi rebels backed by Iran, all on the back door of the six oil-producing monarchies of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Obviously, ISIS itself and its territory in Syria and Iraq, I've argued that Iraq and Syria have both ceased to exist as functioning states. Uh, in Iraq, the Kurds are functionally independent. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're, they're not about to be pushed back into a an Iraq controlled by a regime in Baghdad that's essentially a puppet regime for the Ayatollahs in Tehran. The Sunni Arabs likewise, if the Kurds don't go back in, are not going to go back into an Iraq where they're outnumbered three to one by the Shia under the uh, dominance of, uh, of Iran. Uh, and Syria in its own respect I think is clearly broken apart. I don't know who's going to put that together, although I will say this, I think one consequence of what Erdogan has been doing in Turkey uh, is to set up the possibility of a modus vivendi between Turkey and Assad. It had been 
Uh, Turkey had been one of the leaders in the anti-Assad coalition. I think Erdogan wants stability with the Russians. They have a way of giving that to him. So if, uh, if Turkey stops its role uh, in the anti-Assad coalition such as it is, virtually guarantees Assad remains in power. Um, uh, Iran, I'll come back to later since it's such a special case, but then in Afghanistan we have Taliban and Al-Qaeda very, very close to retaking power. Uh, I think it depends largely on who wins our presidential election because I think uh, if Obama's policies continue to be pursued as he really wanted to, we'd have been out of Afghanistan already and the Taliban would be back in control. And let's not forget Pakistan on the eastern end of this uh, uh, survey of horribles, uh, always in danger since inception, since the partition of the British Raj, uh, a weak and unstable government, uh, but now one with uh, between 60 and 200 nuclear weapons. If Pakistani Taliban uh, took control or another radical group in Pakistan, they would have an arsenal of nuclear weapons immediately uh, that would make them a more serious threat than uh, Iran. And the American policy over this vast region uh, has been one at best of indifference. You know, if you were the government of Israel, you would be praying for a little bit more indifference from this administration. It beats the actual policy they've been pursuing, uh, which is the most hostile to the state of Israel since the modern state was created in 1948. We've never seen anything like it. And you know who is most incredulous? Uh, at the hostility that we've displayed toward Israel. Leaders of the uh, Arab countries of the Arabian Peninsula who pull their hair out and say, if that's the way America treats its best friend in the region, how will they treat us when our time of troubles comes? Uh, and they are deeply concerned, as they should be, that ISIS is perfectly capable uh, of uh, carrying out terrorist attacks against those regimes. Uh, and don't put this scenario uh, too far aside that you could find a way for ISIS to cooperate with the uh, Russian, uh, uh, Syrian, Hezbollah, Iranian coalition uh, to, uh, to proceed against their uh, real mutual enemies, namely the oil producing monarchies. Uh, any, any country uh, that's capable of signing the molotov ribbentrop Pact uh, in, uh, right before World War II is perfectly capable of cutting a deal with ISIS. Uh, and the, uh, the vulnerabilities of countries like Bahrain, uh, Eastern Saudi Arabia, and uh, the rest are, are all too apparent. Uh, and they see no prospect uh, of getting American help. Obviously, they are uh, societies ruled by a very small elite. Uh, Senator Claiborne Pell, who nobody would have mistaken for Holmes or Brandeis, once said about Saudi Arabia, you know, there's got to be uh, a problem with a country that's ruled by 3,000 cousins. <laughs> and so, so the vulnerability to terrorist attack of these, uh, of these societies is, is intense indeed. Uh, and what we've seen over the past uh, eight years, really, is the retreat of American influence uh, from the region as a whole. Uh, a, a complete absence of a strategy to deal with uh, ISIS in particular, uh, an unwillingness to do what's necessary to protect us from this uh, sophisticated threat, a group of Islamic radicals who are better at internet propaganda than we are, uh, who can recruit and train and motivate uh, their adherents at a distance over the internet in Europe, in the United States, it's not merely this wave of hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, into Europe and ultimately into the United States that poses the threat. It's even if they're not radicalized when they leave, uh, they can be radicalized at a distance. Uh, all of this talk you hear from the media about lone wolf terrorists or self-radicalizing terrorists, sort of like spontaneous combustion. They were, they were normal people one day and the next day they became terrorists, uh, is fanciful. There are networks of support. Communication over the internet is easy. We are doing nothing in response. We have failed to understand the ideological uh, nature of this war and we failed to take adequate military steps to collapse the caliphate as soon as possible. 
The president says his objective is to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS. The problem with his strategy is the first three words, degrade and ultimately. The answer to ISIS is to destroy it as rapidly as possible. And, and the, reason, the reason we want to do that is because uh, every day that we delay allows ISIS to implement strategies of terrorism in Western Europe, the United States, and elsewhere. Innocent civilians are at risk because of our unwillingness to take appropriate military action. And just uh, earlier this week, uh, Secretary uh, Clinton said uh, that her opponent actually advocated having American troops involved, and, and by God, under her administration, there would be no American combat troops involved. Maybe somebody should tell her there are 5,000 American fighting personnel in Iraq today, uh, and over 500, we don't know the exact number because it's classified inside Syria. Uh, you know, those are boots on the ground. Those are combat arms. Uh, of the United States. And the problem is not that they're there, it's that they don't have adequate support, they don't have adequate numbers, uh, and they don't have adequate allies to finish this job off. And let's face it, even if we destroyed the caliphate in Syria and Iraq today, they'd simply move somewhere else. I think that's what they're doing now. That's another consequence of a delayed, slow rolling military strategy, is that they can redeploy to whatever their plan B or plan C is. Uh, uh, so so this, this threat is going to be present and uh, gr I think growing uh, when the new president, whoever it is, is inaugurated. Let's remember that Barack Obama's own senior intelligence appointees have testified frequently in public session in Congress this year that the terrorist threat globally is equal to or greater than what it was on September the 11th, 2001. That's what his appointees say. You can imagine what the truth really is. <laughs> and yet he and, and other leaders uh, refuse to acknowledge it. But that really brings me to, to the worst case, which is Iran. Look, the Iran nuclear deal signed in Vienna in the summer of 2015, in my view, is the worst act of appeasement in American history. <laughs> The, the, the Iranians made uh, temporary, easily reversible concessions on their nuclear program. They haven't honored even those. We have plenty of evidence from West German intelligence and others that they're violating the terms of the treaty. I, I don't think they ever intended to comply with its central provisions. Uh, but they made minimal concessions to begin with. In exchange, they got uh, over $100 billion of assets unfrozen. They got sanctions lifted primarily from the Europeans. And now we can see other aspects of this deal that are still coming to light, despite the president's efforts to cover them up, most notably the cash ransom for four American hostages, which the administration has denied for the last eight months and which actually finally the media uh, uncovered something uh, that wasn't handed to them in a White House press release. Uh, there's, there is no doubt. Uh, and I've seen how negotiations like this can proceed where you say with a straight face, okay, we're talking about this issue over here, and over here we're talking about this issue, and of course they're completely unrelated, right? Right, they're completely unrelated. Uh, and then you negotiate them in uh, uh, tandem. Th this, is, this is obviously what happened here. The chronology is inescapable. Uh, what's called implementation day of the nuclear deal was Saturday, January the 16th. Um, the uh, uh, Iran announced the release of the American hostages on the afternoon of Saturday, January the 16th, but wouldn't release them until the next day, uh, and they had assurances that the cash, the 400 million in cash, uh, was on the way. Uh, and we know from one of the American hostages who were told precisely that by the Iranians. Now, the administration can say all at once, we don't pay ransom. Uh, they're the only people on this planet who believe that. Uh, and, that's, and that's the danger. It's not just that Iran now thinks, I guess the good news is that uh, each and every one of you are now officially worth $100 million to the Obama administration. The bad news is everybody else in the world understands it. It's not just Iran. All of our adversaries and even our friends are appalled by what they've seen. 
uh, and the abandonment of our decades-long bipartisan policy of not negotiating with terrorists. But it was all part of the nuclear deal. I, I'm sure this means there are other things we haven't heard of with respect to the deal uh, that will, will come out. Uh, and the uh, government in Tehran is left with a, an essentially unimpeded path toward uh, nuclear weapons, which they can either deliver through their increasingly sophisticated ballistic missile program, or they can give to terrorist groups to bring into this country in a variety of ways across our unsecured borders, uh, bring them to an American city and detonate them at a time uh, that uh, is, is most suitable to them. So the nature of the threat here is extraordinarily broad. Uh, it has been growing. Uh, it has faced in the last eight years no effective American opposition whatever. Uh, I think that all of these matters are still at a place where we can handle them, although they are uh, beginning to slip out of control. Uh, the Iranian nuclear weapons program is a good example. It's not just Turkey, as I mentioned before, that's embarked on its own nuclear weapons program in response. So have the Saudis, uh, so have uh, the Egyptians, and perhaps other governments in the region as well. Uh, that's why I think so much is at stake uh, this election year. And certainly I would never say anything partisan <laughs> to, to an audience like this, but look around, you know. Uh, if you want four more years of Barack Obama, there's a very easy way to get it. Uh, we're in a deep hole. We're in a dangerous period of time. Uh, and it's not simply because of the threat of Islamic radicalism. It's because others, the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, can see that America's withdrawal and uh, inward-looking policies have left the rest of the world uh, more easily subject to their pressures and their agendas. And we either understand that uh, and make the right decision, or the course we're on is going to get worse, and a subsequent president uh, will find it that much more difficult uh, to, to save our country and save our principles. So the best, the best news we have uh, is the citizens who are here today. You understand these issues. You've got a lot of work to do between now and Election Day. Uh, but I'm confident that if this uh, understanding can be spread to friends and colleagues all around the country, uh, we will still prevail as America always has. Thank you very much.